Uh, welcome to the Medical Center Hour. Uh, this is a weekly uh, forum under the auspices of the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. Uh, I'm Jim Childress, uh, pinch hitting for the regular moderator, Marsha Childress. Uh, it's a commonplace, uh, widely noted in the media and, and as well as in medical and public health uh, context and literature, uh, that we face a crisis, uh, an opioid epidemic. At least two million people in the United States are addicted to prescription opioids, and about 600,000 more have an opioid use disorder involving heroin. An average of 90 Americans die each day from overdoses involving an opioid. This epidemic has many causes, but few, if any, clear solutions. Certainly no simple solutions. So what can we do? We're pleased to have two very distinguished speakers uh, help us today better understand this epidemic and identify ways to move forward in the short run and the long run. Our first speaker is Professor Richard Bonney, who is Harrison Foundation Professor of Medicine and Law, Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences, a Director of the Institute of Law, Psychiatry and Public Policy at the School of Law, UVA. Uh, and he was the uh, chair of the uh, study, uh, consensus study uh, for the Institute of uh, Medicine, formerly Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine under the National Academies of, um, of uh, uh, pain management and opioid epidemic balancing societal and individual benefits and risk of prescription opioid use. Our second speaker will be Dr. Leslie Blackhall. Uh, who is Associate Professor of Medicine and Medical Education and Section Head, Palliative Medicine, Division of General, Geriatric, Palliative, and Hospital Medicine, Department of Medicine, UVA. And there are four bios for both of these speakers uh, on the handout. Uh, each will speak for about 20 minutes, thus allowing plenty of time for interaction with you, for your questions uh, and comments and concerns. Uh, Professor Monia. As you heard, well thank you Jim, and as you uh, heard, uh, my assignment uh, is to uh, talk about the National Academy's report, um, consensus study, um, uh, quite a, a deep dive for me, this is uh, the, the charge included uh, pain management and um, I learned a lot about pain that I didn't know before. Um, and its connection to the opioid uh, epidemic, and uh, here's the report, 400 pages long. Um, but I think it's a pretty good job, actually. Um, so I'm going to try to um, uh, give you an overview uh, of the report. I think in terms of the connection between what I'm doing and Leslie, I am giving you kind of the big picture policy perspective. We're actually talking more about national policy and what I'm saying here. FDA commissioned the report. Um, and uh, she's obviously going to talk about the uh, you know uh, challenges in the clinical clinical setting. Uh, hopefully, there'll be some intersections that we can explore um, uh, later. So uh, Jim gave you some of the uh, essential figures here in terms of the background, but uh, it is worth maybe my emphasizing the point that uh, this crisis that we're facing uh, lies at the intersection of two public health challenges. Uh, helping the tens of millions of people who suffer from chronic pain while uh, containing what we know to be the rising toll of harms to individuals, their families, and communities uh, that are associated with addiction to opioids uh, or otherwise to misuse and diversion of those products. Um, uh, as Jim indicated, uh, as of 2015, we're still waiting actually for more recent data. We're all using the two 2015 figures and they're undoubtedly higher than this. Uh, two million Americans uh, aged 12 or older had opioid use disorder involving uh, prescription opioids, and another 600,000 uh, had uh, a uh, opioid use disorder involving heroin. Uh, drug overdose, um, as I think we, we hear a drumbeat in the media about this, this is probably something you've heard before, uh, is now the leading cause of unintentional injury death in the United States, and most of these deaths involve uh, opioids. Uh, somewhere over 30,000 uh, in 2015, 
um, and uh, somewhere over 50,000 for uh, all uh, uh, drug overdoses. Um, what is, I think, particularly noteworthy is that during the period from uh, 1999 to 2011, the annual number of overdose deaths from prescription opioids tripled, um, and it leveled off uh, in subsequent years. However, during the period from 2011 to 2015, overdose deaths, deaths from illicit opioids, including heroin and synthetic opioids, uh, such as fentanyl, nearly tripled in that four-year period. And this was driven in large part by the growing number of people whose use of opioids began uh, with prescription opioids, um, and then they gravitated to the illegal market. And that is, among other things, the most troubling part of this, uh, this epidemic, because you can't look at the problem of prescription opioid abuse or misuse or an addiction. Uh, without recognizing the intersection with the illicit market. And this is the slide that kind of demonstrates the, uh, the uh, uh, increasing and then leveling off, as I said, tripling from 1999 uh, to uh, 2015 uh, of overdose deaths related to prescription opioids. And then you see a fairly flat uh, curve with regard to uh, um, uh, heroin uh, overdoses, uh, but you know, then quadrupling in a very short period of time. Um, the elevator speech version of this um, is pretty simple to put, and I want to make sure that I say it uh, before I try to give you a little bit more of the detail of the report. I think the magnitude of this problem is even greater than the daily, daily headlines uh, suggest. When you look, obviously, beneath these measurable overdose deaths and diagnosed uh, disorders and begin to look you know, uh, more at the geospatial features of this, uh, deeper dive into, you know, the people who are suffering from uh, these, these problems and the impact on their families and communities. Uh, it is uh, really astounding and alarming what is happening, and it is going to get worse before it gets better. I mean, I think that that's, I didn't know that, you know, when we first started studying this, but certainly I think everybody on the committee believes that, that this is, uh, we, haven't, we haven't reached the, the leveling off of this, even despite the tension that's being given to it and the steps that are being uh, taken. It's going to get worse before it gets better, and it's going to take many years uh, for this to unwind, given the number of people that have opioid use disorder uh, um, now. Um, and as you know, I mean, it's a chronic relapsing disorder, um, uh, and um, uh, it, you know, uh, there are going to be more cases. So uh, the story here, as far as the, uh, our committee was concerned, is that we need an all-hands-on-deck approach to this. Uh, we, we have to have coordination across all the, the stakeholder groups, professional groups, as well as the state and local governments and the federal government, all the different federal agencies. You know, there's obviously a tremendous amount of siloing and, and, and so on here. Nobody is really in charge uh, at all, you know, of this. And some greater, you know, coordinated effort is going to have to be undertaken. And it's going to have to be sustained. We're not good at that in this society. We're not good at prevention generally. But we sustaining an effort, I mean, we're getting public attention now. Obviously, you see it actually had a little bit of an impact on the health care debate that was going on in the Congress because of the attention that was being drawn to this. Uh, people are attending, paying attention to this now. Declaration of national emergency is the buzzword for the moment. But um, we have to sustain this attention uh, for many years. It took all this time for this to happen, and it's going to take a very long time for it to unwind, too. And I think that, in, in a way, is maybe the most important message of the uh, report. We did recommend an action plan. Uh, I want to uh, just summarize key parts of this uh, later on, if I run out of time. Uh, you'll at least get the big picture here. Uh, so there are basically six points here. We need a culture change uh, in provider education and in public understanding. A lot of attention, of course, to, to the prescribers and some of the, the concerns that people have had about, about whether there's been adequate uh, education. Um, uh, of the uh, various uh, prescribers. Uh, but it's not only provider education. I think that uh, what hasn't been uh, focused on yet is public understanding um, about the role of opioids and affecting public expectations 
about, uh, about whether opioids are the right answer and the risks that are associated with them and what the benefits of alternatives to opioids might be for whatever their problem uh, is. Um, you can imagine, I mean, have you seen any media effort or media campaign that really is focused on this? You see a lot of ads, you know, for the drugs. But is there really any sustained public education campaign that will reflect the demand and the expectations that people have, you know, uh, regarding the treatment of pain? And it's partly, you know, that we don't talk about pain very much except take a drug, you know, for it. Um, secondly, um, uh, we need an investment in increasing, clearly, we need a huge investment in increasing access to treatment for opioid use disorder and particularly to remove the impediments uh, that now exist, both financial and otherwise, uh, uh, to the use of medications to treat opioid addiction. And this is a huge challenge. It's going to be expensive uh, to do this. We need Medicaid expansion in order to be able to do it. Uh, we need a lot of uh, effort sort of focused on this. And uh, again, it's just hard to emphasize uh, that enough. Uh, obviously, we want to continue to increase uh, access to life-saving medications to reverse the effects of uh, overdose and the various steps that are being taken around the country to increase access to naloxone. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, otherwise um, uh, uh, assist to prevent um, uh, overdose. Um, we need to intensify F uh, FDA effort efforts to incorporate public health considerations into opioid regulation in a systematic fashion and to provide aggressive monitoring and oversight of uh, what happens once the drugs are on the market. The FDA did request this report. They knew that they needed to sort of broaden their regulatory vision in order to be able to take, you know, these uh, 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 considerations that go beyond the risks and benefits to, of the drug to the particular patient and those that affect what happens uh, to the market uh, once the drugs are on the market, taking into account diversion and the risk of diversion taking into account uh, the, the connections, as I've already indicated, between the illicit market and the illegal market, um, and all the dynamic aspects of this uh, epidemic. It's unprecedented. Everything that's going on now, we've had a problem of, in the later slide, you know, talk about, we've had a history of trying to think about the regulation of, of opioid drugs since the 19th century, um, uh, and a lot of struggles um, uh, in relation to op opioid addiction uh, over these years. This, of course, what is happening now is totally unprecedented. We have an endemic problem that's lasted a long time. You know, I've episodic changes, but nothing has happened uh, like this. Um, and so FDA needs to think about how to regulate these drugs in a way that takes all those factors into account and to monitor the effects in the market. I mean, even the issue about abuse deterrent properties of certain drugs, uh, uh, new uh, formulations of them, they can backfire, actually, if you don't uh, uh, recognize how they might be used once they're in the, in the marketplace, and you might make situation even worse uh, by people trying to beat uh, the drug, uh, the, the deterrent features uh, of, the, uh, of the drug. Uh, we need to increase, uh, to strengthen the data and surveillance at all levels. One of the problems here is this part of the, part of the among the many reasons that are the factors that went into this, um, we didn't have decent surveillance systems uh, with regard to these, the, the connections between prescribing and the illicit market. Um, uh, but we had some. There were monitoring uh, uh, data. People were monitoring people in the jails to get uh, uh, an understanding of kind of what the prevalence of drug use and particularly opioid and opioid uh, addiction you know, was in that population. There were seizures that were undertaken and then, uh, you know, assessments of pricing uh, uh, through other data systems that were used in law enforcement. Um, and during the recession, these things got cut out, uh, these data systems. So just at the time that this epidemic was really, you know, increasing, we were missing the data systems that would have provided some advance notice, you know, of what was going on. Um, we, there's a lot about, uh, about pain and its treatment and the prevalence of pain. Uh, the data are not really adequate on that either, and certainly not at the intersection, you know, of pain uh, uh, treatment and uh, opioid, uh, uh, and opioid addiction. So uh, strengthening data and surveillance is absolutely central. Um, we need, obviously, as well to invest on, you know, in research on understanding the neurobiology of pain and its relationship to addiction. 
and on ultimately, you know, the, the holy grail here, the development of non-addictive alternatives to opioids, uh, we have to reverse what has been a long-standing underinvestment in, in pain research uh, and in research on, on, on pain management. Um, the committee uh, included uh, equal numbers, essentially, of, of uh, people, anesthesiologists and others who concentrate in pain and pain management and pain research, uh, and then uh, people from the public health world uh, uh, with specialty, special knowledge of policy development and uh, opioid addiction. Uh, it was a huge committee, um, and it was really the, uh, excellent, you know, the membership, uh, just very impressive group of people, uh, and that's why I say I learned so much uh, from having done it. Um, so, um, uh, what I have in mind uh, uh, is uh, maybe some additional uh, items of summarizing the report, and then a couple of reflections, uh, just from my own perspective, on uh, the challenges that I think that this posed. You know, I presented, I think, the, it sounds like a fairly coherent report and maybe persuasive to you, uh, but there are a lot of puzzles that are involved in thinking about this topic. Um, all right, the, 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 the task was to summarize the state of the science, and particularly with regard to pain management, since the IOM did a report on the subject in 2011, characterize the epidemiology of the opioid epidemic, and then make recommendations to the FDA and others, and I've summarized all that for you. Uh, with regard to pain management, now maybe by this time everybody in this room maybe is aware of these, these findings, but they're important, they underlie so many of the recently issued clinical guidelines by CDC and elsewhere, but it can't be said too many times that opioid analgesics are widely accepted as effective for acute pain, as well as pain related to cancer uh, and at the end of life. But data demonstrating the benefits of long-term opioid therapy for chronic non-cancer pain are lacking. Uh, some data suggest that it, in fact, makes it worse for some you know, people. Uh, and, and, and we have very little that is measured in terms of functional outcomes. Uh, we have you know, subjective pain reports. So the data are lacking. I mean, we didn't say there aren't any. You know, I mean, we, we did say there aren't any. It's not that you, you know, have uh, you know, proof of lack of effectiveness. Um, but there is some evidence of that, too. Uh, Long-term use of opioids is associated with increased risk, obviously, of opioid use disorder, overdose, and other adverse outcomes as well. Uh, and so the risk benefit for any individual patient, obviously, you know, is a, um, uh, you know, it's not close um, unless nothing else has worked for really severe pain. Uh, there are many non-opioid alternatives for the management of chronic pain, uh, ranging uh, from non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, anticonvulsants, antidepressants, and analgesic creams and patches, non-pharmacologic uh, 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 therapies, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness meditation, physical therapy and exercise, interventional injections, nerve stimulators, uh, uh, and uh, medication pumps. There are uh, alternatives. While each non-opioid alternative has its own indications and risks, uh, these treatments uh, can, in some patients, be more effective, and at least as effective, uh, as opioids for reducing pain, and often carry a lower risk, obviously, of the adverse outcomes when they are used uh, appropriately. And when I mentioned the importance of you know, pain education for the population at large, not only for you know, prescribers, uh, this is uh, important. Comparative effectiveness and long-term outcome data are sparse for most of these alternative therapies, as they are, of course, with regard to the opioids themselves. Um, all right. Despite recent scientific advances, identification of individuals at risk of opioid, at higher risk, particularly vulnerable to, susceptible to opioid use disorder, uh, requires much better characterization of the neurobiological interaction between chronic pain and opioid use. And despite the prevalence of pain and opioid use disorder and the related costs uh, to society and repeated calls to action for more research on this, uh, as I've indicated earlier, research on pain remains poorly resourced. Um, I think this is another thing that was uh, eye-opening to me. I kind of expected that a lot of the science in the report would really focus on uh, the connection 
um, uh, between um, at, at, at the very basic mechanistic level and then all the way into the clinical and, and, and social level uh, between opioid uh, vulnerability to opioid addiction and, and, and addiction on the one hand and pain management on the other. And I was just really surprised at how little uh, there was, and this is a, a key recommendation, you know, in the report. There should be a whole other, you know, research uh, initiative, um, you know, on this area, and then in an appropriate time, there ought to be another study uh, on that uh, issue. Um, I think I will skip um, the, the, the various recommendations, because um, I've kind of summarized them uh, already. Um, say a word about the FDA. So this is a schematic presentation of the FDA's drug approval process, as you all presumably are familiar with. And what we basically said is that at every step along the way, from the preclinical studies into the clinical, the initial clinical trials, into the uh, uh, new drug application stage, uh, and approval, and then post-approval, and the monitoring afterwards, at every stage of this process, things have to be done differently with regard to opioids. We kind of, you know, one of our committee members characterized this as opioid exceptionalism. Uh, there are just special reasons that you have to, you know, have to do things differently in this connection. And at every, in every, so we made recommendations about collecting all this relevant data that is not, as I said, it's usually beyond the agency's regulatory vision. They're going to have to undertake different ways of trying to get a hold of it. They're going to also have to have a more quantitative approach to uh, decision-making about weighing risks and benefits once you widen the regulatory vision in this way, that kind of a qualitative judgment about risks and benefits isn't going to do it. We need population-level data and, uh, you know, with all the dynamic effects uh, in the marketplace that can be affected by putting these drugs on the market. So there's a real challenge here for them to have a different regulatory approach, and they have to do it every point along the way, and they have to be aggressive about it. So uh, the, the report basically just walks through pre-approval uh, testing in terms of getting kinds of data that you don't normally get at that stage, uh, post-approval monitoring, uh, and then specific recommendations uh, all the way down the line. Um, so, Jim, I, do I have until 25 after? Uh, yes, go ahead. Thank okay. You. All right. So um, I, I wanted to say some things here about the complexities of doing this. I've sort of given you the picture of the report. I think, as I said, I think we did a good job. But there are puzzles here, right? I mean, so, I mean I've given you the elevator speech, you know, I'm convinced that we need to do the things that I've said. But some of these issues are actually quite hard. Uh, so there are ethical complexities here. The charge to the committee was to give FDA uh, recommendations about how it can balance the needs of patients in pain and the needs of society that are related. Uh, uh, you know, um, associated with the uh, uh, opioid uh, uh, disorder uh, and overdose. And um, conducting that balance is difficult. I've already indicated at a policy level, you could kind of imagine having quality adjusted, uh, you know, uh, uh, life years and, and, and uh, you know, other measures uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, trying to have an overall ma mathematical approach to this and think about what the, uh, the, the, the benefits of putting a drug on the market in terms of providing treatment for pain for people who otherwise uh, can't get the relief that they need, and then took that up and then took up what the consequences of diversion from the market and uh, opioid use disorder that develops, notwithstanding efforts to prevent it, and so on, and try to figure out, so what is the, where is the sweet spot here you know, with regard to regulation? And that would apply not only to FDA's approval decisions, but there are decisions, of course, as we know, that are being made at the state and local level all over the country about, and some of them, arbitrary restrictions, you know, on access to opioids, and people, of course, are worried about what the consequences. So, you know, people in pain or, and their doctors are worried about the consequences of that. Well, how, and, and given what I've already said is fairly weak data, uh, you know, on a lot of these things, how do you actually, you know, conduct that policy balance? Um, and one of the, uh, the issue is, is that the, the, the ethics of public health uh, regulation, uh, which requires this aggregated approach that I've just described, um, are in tension with the ethics at the bedside and the needs that particular patients had and the dependence, uh, their, their uh, relationship with physicians who, you know, whose duty is to try to help the patient as best as possible, you know, uh, given the things that have worked or not worked. Um, and how do you crank that 
the, the uh, importance of the physician-patient relationship uh, and the needs of the particular patient into this kind of mathematical approach that I've just described. And it was a constant source of tension between, you know, some of the clinically oriented people in the committee as well uh, as the, you know, more mathematically oriented policy uh, uh, people. And we need to do both and you need to make room for appropriate discretion and that's why I say the committee certainly said even though we're trying to push the FDA toward this regulatory approach that I've described we have to make sure that you leave room for appropriate ex and responsible exercises of clinical discretion given the particular needs that patients have and avoid arbitrary restrictions excuse me under those circumstances so that was one struggle we had uh, you know in the uh, report another set of issues um, that I'll just mention here and you can have them in your mind is how did this happen? Um, and there are multiple sort of vectors that are at work here and intersecting narratives that, you know, uh, I think you can kind of see almost in the, on a daily basis in the newspapers. There's kind of the one side is the supply and the increased supply of opioids you know, from the manufacturers and then into the marketplace and the increased prescribing and the promotion of the drugs. Um, and so supply is the vector, you know, through the industry. Uh, and we had total system failure in trying to, you know, you know, to prevent bad things from happening. That's one story. We also have this incredibly important inequality and social determinant story relating to the number of people in despair and their vulnerability. And uh, obviously that plays a huge role uh, in this. And you can see they, well, they're not inconsistent narratives. Uh, but they are different narratives uh, in terms of trying to understand, you know, why this happened and uh, how we can deal with it uh, in the future. And I've already mentioned, uh, and I'll just allude to it again, that we have this history. And we have a history of failure <laughs> in drug policy. We had an opportunity, frankly, in the early 1970s when the Controlled Substances Act was passed to actually take a public health approach to addiction. And we did for a while in the 70s, and then it disappeared in the wake of a drug war, and things got worse, and all the preventive mechanisms that I've already described and the opportunities to actually, uh, uh, you know, prevent things from happening by having more aggressive, you know, oversight and regulation, data collection, just fell by the wayside. So that's another part of the story here, is basically a failure of governance, you know, as well. Can you guys hear me? All right, I'm going to uh, tell a slightly different story about this. As someone who was, I think, involved in some of the reasons why we have this problem we currently have, and I'm putting up this pendulum for reasons that will become clear. So I'm going to start back a long time ago when I was in medical school and residency and starting my practice and at that point starting to do a lot of work with cancer pain through work in hospice and palliative care. And in the early 80s and 90s, we identified a different sort of crisis, which was a crisis of untreated cancer pain. So in general, there was a lot more attention being paid at that moment to end-of-life care. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross had sort of put a book out. There was a lot of legal and ethical um, uh, controversy over whether it was okay to take people off life support and how to have discussions. And that's when we started having living wills and advanced directives. And as a, sort of a part of that overall discussion, um, a lot of people, a lot of us started talking about uncontrolled cancer pain. I don't know. Some of you are old enough to remember Jack Kevorkian, who was a guy who believed in euthanasia and had a little euthanasia machine that used to, you know, um, euthanize people. And, and there would be, you know, discussions on NPR about should people be able to kill themselves at the end of life rather than suffer unbearable pain? And, you know, I'd be sort of yelling at, I'm this sort of person anyway, but I'd be yelling at the radio about, like, why don't we, you know, control the pain? And as a beginning, anyway, of of that, and that's a long story. So here are just a few of the research, you know, well-known papers that were very influential during that time. Uh, the support study, which was a major bioethics study, showing that half of seriously ill, seriously ill, meaning people who were likely to die within the next year, um, adults had 
pain, and a fair number of them had severe pain. Uh, Charles Cleland did a series of really excellent studies on cancer pain, showing that about 70% of people with advanced cancer had severe pain. Uh, some studies have shown people with metastatic diseases up to 90%. And almost half of those had inadequate pain control. And the last study was a study of that um, ECOG is Eastern Cooperative Oncologist Group. So these are a major uh, oncology organization. 86% of them felt that their patients' cancer-related pain was poorly treated. Half of them felt that their own pain management of their own patients were poorly treated. I guess the other 30% felt that everybody else sucked and they were okay. And 31% of them said, that they would wait until the patient was terminally ill, like very close to the end of life before they would prescribe a narcotic. So at this point, I was in California doing hospice and palliative medicine, and I would see people in their home with hospice who had never received an opiate stronger than hydrocodone, which is a very weak opiate. More than half the oncologists in California at that time did not even have a DEA license to prescribe strong narcotics because they were afraid of getting arrested. They actually, if you wrote a Narcotics prescription was a triplicate. One, you had to keep, some people are shaking their heads and remember this, hi John. And you know, one copy you kept, one copy went to the, you know, the drugstore to the pharmacist, and another went to the DEA. So people just refused to do it. So I'd go home, I'd do home visits on patients, and I would get their pain under control literally in a couple of days, and the family members would ask me, why did he have to wait until the last two weeks of his life to get pain control when he's had years of living with this cancer and being miserable. And that's, that was the crisis we were responding to. Um, I was part of this, the uh, cancer pain initiatives. There was a state by state and a national organization to try to improve the treatment of cancer pain. Um, here was something the World Health Organization came out. This was the cancer pain, they called it the cancer pain ladder, but it looks like a staircase to me, but never mind. Um, so it emphasized, you know, you start with non-opiates, but often go up to mild, mild to moderate opiates, that would be like hydrocodone or something, and then, you know, stronger opiates. And there was actually a study done during that, and there are many studies looking at the effectiveness of opiates for cancer-related pain. And as Professor Bonnie said, this is the one indication for which it's been shown to be effective. And, um, you know, 70% of patients in this study using guidelines, the WHO guidelines had good control of their cancer pain. <clears throat> and 16% had, so 86% had either good control or adequate control using this guideline. And so this, this seemed like, you know, what we needed to do. Um, Betty Farrell, who was a nurse um, PhD at the City of Hope in Duarte, California, taught a generation of us how to do good cancer pain control with she had yearly or twice a year uh, conferences about that because there was very little teaching and she was the person who headed the HCPR guidelines for cancer pain and part of that was they did some looked at studies some of which were done by Charles Cleland on why is it that people with cancer can't get good um, pain control and there were patient related barriers and oh, but the two biggest ones from the physician side were concerns that they were going to be arrested or have their license yanked for prescribing opiates for their cancer patients and fear that their patients were going to become addicted. So here is a very famous, very short letter to the editor that everybody, including me, cited as a reason why you didn't have to worry that your patient was going to become addicted to opiates. And I kid you not, this thing was cited a million times. Here's a little thing that says 264 articles cited. And so they looked at 11, almost 12,000 patients who got opiates in the hospital and found that like four of them had an addiction problem. Of course, they only looked at them when they were in the hospital, so I'm not sure how you would have known the addiction problem. But So this seemed like things were... You know, so then, then what happened? So the HCPR guidelines actually suggested the panel recommends that laws and regulatory policies aimed at diversion <coughs> control not hamper appropriate use of opiate analgesics for cancer pain. So if you want to know where the, the problem came, why people started prescribing all these opiates, then I would just say it's my fault, okay? The fault of my um, 
profession in a certain way, okay? Um, and I will also say, I was there. This is why I had that pendulum, to see people curled in the fetal position of pain and nobody would give them an opiate stronger than hydrocodone, even though they had cancer throughout their whole body. Um, so the JCO, Joint Commission on Accreditation of Hospitals, um, partly as a result of all this pushing, had pain the fifth vital sign, and then there was this big push to change the regulations, and it was in 2002 where they proposed changes for the regulation of opiates for cancer, and here we see the bleed over into non-cancer since somehow we had proved, which we really hadn't, it was that one little thing that that opiates were the answer to cancer pain. People had the worst pain of all. They must be good for every other kind of pain. And so there was a bleed over there. Around the same time, also, we had another thing happening, which was the growth of hospices. In 1992, 14% of people who died had hospice. And by 2007, almost 40% did. And hospice is a place where people you have nurses there who are making sure your pain is well controlled, so increasingly people are getting the pain control they needed, but they're having a lot of opiates sitting around their home. They're not in the hospital getting the opiates, they're having 240 oxycodone pills in a bottle at their home. So I would say that these trends to increase the treatment of mainly cancer-related pain, along with sort of hooked up with the marketing of oxycontin. So oxycontin, you know, the the executives marketing this thing, you know, sort of took people's concern about cancer-related pain and all of a sudden everybody needed OxyContin and all of a sudden the prescriptions for opioids skyrocketed. And that seemed okay for a while. You can see up till about the late 90s, things look fairly stable and then bam. So this is a famous article in the New England Journal of Medicine and I think you went through this more. I don't think we need to beat this. So here we are, you know, this is my concern. Here's the CDC guidelines. The CDC came out with guidelines for the prescription of opiates for cancer pain, and almost every state has had new laws and regulations about this, but almost all of them say, accept cancer, hospice, and palliative care. So is that all right? I mean, so in a way, that should be all right, right? We proved that cancer pain is well treated by opiates. We know what it was like when people wouldn't use them. I mean, this is what I do for a living. I work in the cancer center, uh, mostly. I see patients in the hospital as well, but these days my clinical practice is mostly seeing people of severe cancer-related pain in the cancer center. And so maybe we should just be pulling them back from everyone else. So weirdly enough, I'm gonna argue against that. <laughs> since I spent the first half of my career arguing on the other side, what I don't feel like we need is for it to go, you know, we need to come to some other way of doing this. So where do people who abuse prescription opiates get them? Well, here's the thing. They are not stealing them from a pharmacy or a doctor's office, because doctors don't have them lying around their office, or they shouldn't anyway. Um, mostly, 34% of them are getting from a single doctor. They're not doctor shopping, they're getting them from one doctor, usually for pain. And another 54% are getting them from a friend or family member. They're either stealing them, they're giving them, or, or they're buying them. So essentially, if you look at it, people are getting prescribed opiates for pain, and their friends or family members are stealing them, buying them, or um, being given them. That's how they get there. There's a little bit of everything else, but that's a, by the majority where they get them. So, the doctors who prescribe these pain medications, who are they? Well, we looked at UVA, okay, for a project that the, I was working on, and so who's prescribing? Where are the, all these strong opiates coming from? Well, if you look at opiates that are prescribed for more than two weeks and are stronger than tramadol, which is the weakest opiate, it's barely an opiate, and it's not usually a drug of abuse, Almost half of them are prescribed in the cancer center. And if you look at the really strong ones, not like somebody gets, you know, enough oxycodone to take one a day for a month, but the ones who get, you know, 20 milligrams every four hours of oxycodone, that's the cancer center. And rightfully so. Okay? 
But I would argue that if you want to keep all these opiates being, from flooding onto the street, you have to go to deal with what's happening in the cancer center. Because that's where they're coming from. <laughs> Even though I was on all these cancer pain initiatives, arguing just the opposite in a certain way. <laughs> so I can say that when we started realizing what was happening, uh, Dr. Barkley and I, he's another palliative care doctor, started the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine Special Interest Group on Substance Abuse and Diversion. And we started projects around this. We did a lot of research on, you know, just by survey research, looking at, you know, how many oncologists, palliative care clinicians, and hospices actually have, you know, any formal regulations or rules or policies about how they prescribe opiates, do they actually screen people for risk, do they ever do urine drug screens, and do they ever, you know, check the prescription monitoring program, and the answer is very few of them do, at least the time, these are in 2013, 2014, I suspect it would be a little more. So because it's the cancer patients who need them, and we were talking, and we can see how much they need them, we're not doing due diligence. But I am telling you, here's the two sides of this. Um, first of all, pain and severe pain is the most common symptom of patients with advanced cancer. And cancer-related pain, like we said, it's the only real, you know, aside from acute pain from surgery or breaking your leg or whatever, it's the only indication that it's ever been shown for opiates to really help. But on the other hand, if you want to get a hold of all the opiates that are flooding into the market, that's the cancer patients. And just because you have cancer doesn't mean you don't also have a substance abuse disorder. On the contrary, I see a lot of patients who've had neck cancer, one of the most painful cancers in the treatment. Don't chew tobacco, guys, because if you get head and neck cancer, that's seven weeks of radiation to some very tender parts of your body, and it's incredible, but you know, they have a very high risk of substance abuse. You get that disease by not just chewing tobacco, but by drinking very heavily, which is associated, both of those things associated with other substance abuse disorders. And they have a high risk of depression, anxiety. So they both need it, and they have a very high risk. So here it is. Opiates are effective and often necessary, but patients, I mean, if somewhere around 10 to percent, I mean, I've heard a lot of, you could probably tell more than I, but I've seen some things that 10% of people, in the, of adults in the country have some form of a substance abuse disorder. And if you look at just unemployed people, it's closer to 18%, okay? If 18% of the have, that means everybody in this room probably has a friend or a family member who has that problem. And people are shaking their head. And if you don't think you, they do, I bet there's someone there. And you just don't know it. Um, <laughs> My, my aunt used to drink a lot of orange juice, but I don't think it was just orange juice. I found those little bottles. Um, so, and, and, and finally, but also people, so it's not just the patients, it's the family members who are often having to take care of my cancer patients as they decline and get near the end of their life, and they need someone to give them their medication. So this is a problem. So we started a project, and we actually have written some policies for the, you know, model policies for Virginia hospices, and that looks at doing those things that you're supposed to do for non-cancer pain, but doing them in cancer patients with a slightly different risk-benefit ratio to how you decide how to use them. So everybody should get risk assessment. We use a very short thing called the opioid risk tool because it asks about family history of, as well as patient history. And because those patients are in, grandson is driving grandma to get her cancer treatment, and he just got out of jail for selling something, heroin or something. Your PMP is a prescription monitor program, the UDS, the urine drugs. So it's fine, we can do this, and we do do this on everybody. But what happens when your patient shows up with, you know, something abnormal? What are you gonna do about it? So I'm gonna give you, quickly, this is the end, I'm just gonna give you a case, okay, to let you a flavor of what it's like, okay? So this is a 38-year-old guy referred to us because of severe pain. He was 38 years old, and he had prostate cancer metastatic literally every vertebrae, okay? He was in severe pain. Also, he had a very long-standing and recent use of a wide variety of illicit substances, including cocaine, and he already had one urine drug screen positive for cocaine, and additionally, he was living with his cousin, 
who is an active substance abuser. So here you go. So he was, I mean, definitely this guy's curled on the table in the fetal position. He needed opiates, number one. And he was very high risk, like as high risk as you can possibly be for misusing his opiates, combining his opiates with something else that would cause him to be unsafe or selling his opiates to buy cocaine. This was a bad situation. So in this case, what we do is we call it putting someone on a short leash. We agreed, you know, the providers at the clinic agreed he needed them. We gave him a one week supply. We called social work and asked them, because we are lucky enough in the cancer center to have those resources, which most places don't. We have social workers who can do counseling and stuff like that. And a urine drugs we did at each visit. And he had a lot of depression and anxiety, and we treated those things. So once he got you know, good pain control, he actually improved. He was able to walk into my clinic, which he hadn't been. He was feeling better. On the other hand, his urine drug screen came back with a variety of things it shouldn't have, including cocaine, some alcohol, different stuff like that. This is not a good thing. So, call it. so this happened over a couple of weeks, you know, and he continued to have problems, so we put together a further safety plan. The social worker helped him move out into his ex-wife's house, who was willing to take care of him despite everything. Uh, we referred him to his local community service board, which he never went to because he was getting a lot of radiation, he didn't have time. And it was so unsafe what he was doing that we came up with this plan. He had to come, and now this man lived two hours away. He had to come to our clinic three times a week and each time he got one fentanyl patch, which we would place on him. And the reason for this is he couldn't, there wasn't enough to really sell effectively or cause himself to overdose himself. So literally they had to drive four hours, three days a week each time to get one fentanyl patch. Within a couple of weeks of that, um, you know, he stopped having cocaine in his urine and we were able to eventually, I don't want to go into the whole thing, but over a, you know, a period of time, his aberrant use decreased and he went through treatment and eventually he had you know, a metastatic disease and within about a year after that, he was on hospice and at that time on higher doses of medication. And, and we maintain our relationship with him and he was able to die and be fairly comfortable during that whole process. So I'm, I'm gonna stop, I think, uh, this is, I'll just say this is a case, I, it was actually, they interviewed me about it in the Washington Post of a lady who had dementia and end-stage breast cancer and she was nonverbal from her dementia, was always crying out in pain, always crying out in pain. The hospice nurse would call, we'd keep going up on her medications until her daughter showed up in the ED, overdosed on her mother's meds. When her mother came in, the reason the mother was crying out in pain was because she wasn't getting any of her medications. So it's not always the patient. So there's two questions people ask me about this. The first is, why do you worry about this? I mean, people are dying. Who cares if they're abusing their drugs? So I feel like this is like in the 1950s, most of you would tell you, you'd have these movies where there was like the happy drunk. You know what I mean? The town drunk. And he was always sort of a comical character. I think we now know that people are actively abusing substances. They're not happy people. They're miserable. They're suffering and their families are suffering. And, and the community is also at risk. So that's why even if the patient is close to the end of life, we have to worry about that. And the other question is, why don't you just fire them, meaning not prescribe for them? I mean, it's a risk to my license to be prescribing pain medications for somebody who has ongoing abnormal urine drug screens. I mean, if they have no opiate in their urine, I don't prescribe for them, because that means they don't take it. But if they're struggling with their terminal cancer and are not able to keep quite to the, you know, and are still having problems with substance misuse, I don't think that those people need to die in pain. There are times when I can't prescribe them, when the situation is too risky unless they go to a, like a skilled facility of some kind where someone else can give them to them. But I don't think that it's right that people should die in the type of pain I used to see people die in. So that's why. And I'll just say the last thing, just from a clinician's point of view, I mean, treatment options for patients with substance abuse, they are almost non-existent. I have a patient with severe cocaine disorder. He had to go to rehab for his clonazepam, which he was not abusing, just to get into rehab because there's no rehab available for people with his Medicaid in the state of Virginia. He ended up going to somewhere in North Carolina. I mean, you know, sorry, I could rant about this, but <laughs> if you have a lot of money, you, have resource, you can do it. But there are no. There's one half-day Suboxone clinic per week at the University.
University of Virginia. There is no methadone maintenance. And that's wrong. And also, all these great non-pharmacological therapies, you, you can't get those. I mean, you can get them at the cancer center because we have social workers who actually can do that with people. But they would have to, some of them, if they live six hours away, which some of our patients do, they drive for their chemo, so they'd have to come there a couple times a week. They're not. That's not available for people. And frankly, some of the non-opioid medications are too expensive. Oh, oxycodone is cheap. Cognitive behavioral therapy is expensive. And nobody makes money off of it. Sorry, am I getting cynical here? Yes. <laughs> and I think we all need to be trained a little better. You know, we have a, a bunch of patients, like 20% of our population, who we're sometimes seeing every week, every two weeks. This is a lot of work for us. Um, but I think, but I think this is what I'm saying. I don't think we want the pendulum to go the whole other way. But we can't just exempt cancer and have just because they have cancer, we're just not going to even look at it. So that's. That's all I'm going to say, and I think we have a little bit of time for questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard and Leslie, for a wonderful presentation. We do have time for some questions and comments, so we'll, uh, uh, John and I have mics, we'll come to you. Uh, raise your hand, uh, identify yourself, and uh, then give us your uh, question for the figure. I'm Danny Becker, and I prescribe opioids. Um, <laughs> question, um, did any of the pharma executives um, go to prison for hiding evidence of the addictive properties of OxyContin? I know that Purdue got fined about half a billion dollars, which is about 5% of their total profits for OxyContin. But what about jail time? That sounded like a rhetorical question. <laughs> uh, did anybody go to jail for the uh, entire collapse of the banking subprime mortgage? Bargain? Yeah. I, I will say, as far as the, our committee was concerned, our job was to look forward. And that's why I put the, well, how did this happen, you know, slide it in. We, that wasn't our job to basically try to ferret this out. Um, but I just saw the big short. Yeah. Yes, if you saw it, we'll be Dr. Williamson, uh, retired for some years. Uh, what about the advertising? I launched an occasional program, and there's always some form of Amazon or asking or this or that. And then this people gets out. I said, hey, how about opioid induced constipation? How do you sell that side? We should stop as a profession. We should stop the availability of advertising for drugs and medications. Period. Well, so short answer to this, um, the Supreme Court has interpreted the First Amendment to cover commercial speech. Uh, 30 years ago, you didn't have these ads. Um, and now we have them. We did recommend to the FDA that they use the maximum amount of constitutional authority uh, and push the edges in on the you know on their constitutional authority to be much more aggressive in regulating direct to consumer advertising as well as advertising that's directed at physicians too. So their promotional activities goes back to what Danny was saying you know before. I mean they obviously played a role in this and continue to play a role in it. And the FDA, we're just asking them to be more aggressive uh, about it. But from a regulator's standpoint, if you've got so many things to do, you know, do you want to sort of concentrate your efforts on something that you're going to get sure, thrown out of the court? Sure, pass a law. Well, the, con the Constitution is in the way of a law. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Hi, my name is Eric Hewlett. I'm a retired faculty member of the Department of Medicine and I don't prescribe opioids, how does the prescription or monitoring plan program work? Who, who does the monitoring? Does the program do that and inform people, or you have to do it yourself actively? How does it work? So all pharmacies have to report to the prescription monitoring program anytime they fill an opioid prescription for how many and um, who wrote it, where it was filled. So 
All I have to do, and it's going to get even easier when with the new computer system we're putting together, all I have to do, well, I'm actually somebody in my office, before all my patients come in, does it, and I can look at everything they've gotten in the past year, when they got it, what it was, and who wrote the prescription. So, I mean, this helps in general, like somebody comes in to my new consult, what do you take for your pain? The little white one. You know, like, I don't know what that is, so then I can look it up. But yeah, so that's how it works. And this is so we don't have to do it, the pharmacists have to do it. This is within the state of Virginia? Yes, there's a Virginia PMP, but I can click and say I want to look at West Virginia. So a lot of them around here have, you know, like reciprocal things. So I can look at uh, West Virginia, Tennessee, and I think Maryland. So usually people are not. I think for a while the VA didn't have to report, but I think, didn't they get rid of that? Yeah, so for a while the VA was exempt for some reason because I don't know why. Because, uh, I don't know. But now they have to report. The details on these programs differ widely across the states, yeah. um, and the data so far are not robust, um, uh, and so, you know, different people have access to the information in different states, um, and so we recommend it, obviously, that, you know, that these be studied carefully and that the things that seem to work and get the balance right, um, you know, should be, should be uh, 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 developed elsewhere. But if you saw that slide I had on where are people getting the drugs, it mostly isn't that they're doctor shopping. They're mostly getting it from, they're stealing it from grandma, you know. And my patients have their family members steal their medications. By the way, I mean, on what Leslie said earlier, I mean, when she first mentioned to me this, uh, you know, the percentage, I think she said 45, 48, 40, 45%, you know, of all the drugs stronger than tramadol on an outpatient basis, you know, or prescribed in the cancer center, I was completely flabbergasted. You know, we just, as she suggested, we just sort of carved out cancer pain and said that's a separate problem. And most of our problem is presumably not attributable to diversion, you know, from patients, you know, who are receiving, uh, you know, uh, pain for, for cancer, receiving treatment for their cancer pain. Um, so this is just astounding, actually, this figure, and we paid no attention to it whatsoever. So, so here's a story from one of my hosp the hospice nurses I work with told me she went to the house of a patient who just died to pronounce the patient and she was helping the family dispose of the pain the medications including the narcotics which included methadone which we use a lot for strong pain and the granddaughter looked at her and said you can't throw that away that's my inheritance hi um, my name is Catherine I'm an undergraduate biomedical engineer um, so in terms of training and guidelines for physicians that are prescribing opioids, is there anything more in depth than that ladder staircase you showed, or is it just kind of judgment based on patient files, what the patient's telling you? Dude, I don't even think the undergraduate, the medical students get like almost zero training. Wouldn't you say, Danny, very little? Um, very little. I mean, we, we, it, it comes up a lot at the general medicine clinic, and we give that two hours of that to the intern during the first couple months. Um, and it, it's, you know, uh, most of what we learn, we learn uh, in the front lines, and it's, it's unavoidable. So I, I think there is a skill set, and it's pretty comprehensive, but there's a lack of resources. So we end up with pain that we really can't manage very effectively. This was a central recommendation, you know, in the report. I mean, again, this is one of the, the you know, the pain specialists were just, I could not believe how little undergraduate medical education was devoted, you know, to this. Even the, um, people and we have to do something. I mean, that, I think, is a central recommendation. And I do think the National Academy of Medicine, the Surgeon General, the public health leadership of this country really needs to focus on, on, on this. If there's anything else, if, there, if there's anything that happens as a result of this report, if this were accomplished, I think we would make it. Yeah, the, the, the state of Virginia has required that all licensed physicians get two hours of CMA on, on opioid use. Two hours. Well, uh, unfortunately, given all the important issues raised by our wonderful panelists and the questions you have, we unfortunately have to bring this to a close. I think they may be able to stay around for a few minutes if you want to follow up with them. Uh, I thank, join me in thanking him very much for that.